Hello, my name is Graham Hatful. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Pittsburgh uh, and a Howard Hughes Medical Institute professor. And we're going to talk today about bacteriophages, their genes and their genomes. Um, first of all, in part one, um, I'd like to just discuss what bacteriophages are, um, some of their biological properties, uh, and how they were discovered. So bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacterial hosts. So just as we and our, some of our, many of our animal cousins uh, are infected by viruses that are specific for us, bacteria also have viruses that infect them, and they're called bacteriophages, or phages for short. They were discovered or co-discovered by um, Felix Durrell and Frederick Twart um, in between 1915 and 1918. And they were discovered as agents that when added or present in a culture of growing bacteria were capable of, uh, of killing the bacteria and essentially um, having a, a bactericidal uh, effect. It was really um, Felix Durrell who developed an assay called the plaque test um, where he was able to um, take samples of uh, bacteriophages uh, that were able to kill bacteria and he made dilutions, increasingly greater a series, a series of dilutions of the bacteriophage sample and then plate that out in the presence of the bacterial host on solid me media using like petri dishes as shown here um, and what he saw was, was that when he diluted out the sample sufficiently he could see individual areas of killing um, as you can see here uh, with smaller and large areas where the cells are dead uh, and where the viruses have grown. These are called plaques and each one of these individual plaques has arisen by a single particle which was capable uh, of infecting a cell and as the bacteria grew across the surface of the agar dish um, the virus um, propagated itself multiplied uh, until in, in, in the plaque here there may be perhaps uh, a million or ten million or more individual phage particles. This plaque test was really important because um, they could tell from looking at uh, cultures of or looking at lysates of bacteriophages that there was nothing to see in there. Um, they could filter the samples, they knew they still had the infectious property, um, but the tube looked completely clear, there was nothing to see, and when they placed these particles um, with this capability in the light microscope, um, there was nothing to be seen. So this, these were mysterious entities, um, but Felix Durrell showed conclusively that they really are particulate in nature. It was somewhat later, in the 19, late 1930s and 1940s, that the electron microscope was, uh, was developed, which has a level of resolution way beyond the light microscope, uh, and uh, was able to show for the very first time what viruses, including bacteriophages, actually look like. And I'll show you some pictures in a minute, um, but this just shows a, a stylized example of what one of those phages looked like. Um, at the very top here you can see is a structure that is referred to as the head. Sometimes it's called the capsid. That is attached to this uh, longer structure here, which is the tail. And the DNA, or the genetic information that the virus carries in order to, uh, to multiply itself, the instructions for its own replication are carried here uh, in the virus head. And so um, we can see and we now know uh, of our understanding of what this particular uh, virus and these types of viruses look like is that this structure here at the very bottom, which is the tip of the tail, that is the region that recognizes and binds to the outside of the bacterial host. During the process of infection, the structures that we see principally constructed or made up of protein components, that stuff stays on the outside of the cell and the DNA or the genetic information um, is what passes from the head through the tail 
into the cell and then reprograms that cell in order to make more copies of the virus. By electron microscopy, um, we can see and we now know that a very large proportion of these uh, naturally found viruses are in an order which are referred to as the chordoviralis, of which these are primarily phages that contain tails, as I just described and shown in these examples here, and they contain double-stranded DNA. So there's lots of different types of viruses in different shapes, but the vast majority that you find in nature fall into this particular uh, order. And uh, these have names according to the types of tails that they have. Um, these are the myoviridae, and they have contractile tails, and so the tail actually contracts like a syringe when the DNA is injected into the bacterial host. These are called the podoviridae, um, which have little short stubby tails, uh, and these ones on the right here are the cyphoviridae, uh, and these have long, uh, non-contractile and flexible tails. So these are the main forms of these viruses. There are, however, a variety of number um, of different types of viruses that have different shapes and have, indeed, different types of uh, DNA or RNA genomes within them. So we can think about the various steps that are involved in the propagation uh, of a bacteriophage during this process known as lytic growth. Um, the phage starts by adsorbing to the outside of the cell. The DNA is injected inside the cell in this process of penetration. There is a set of early proteins uh, which are encoded by the phage but which uses the host machinery to express them. Viral DNA is replicated to make lots more copies of the virus DNA. And then these late proteins are expressed um, that make uh, the structures that I just showed you uh, in the electron microscope. The, the capsid structure gets assembled, the tails get assembled, and then in a process of DNA packaging, the DNA is stuffed into those heads until the heads are full. The tails are attached, and at the very final step of this process, um, the bacterial cell is going to lyse um, with enzymes encoded by the phage genome to break open the outside of the cell, and the progeny viruses, typically 50 to 100 new progeny virus viruses will be released and to go on and repeat this cycle whenever they find another bacterial host. So while many phages go through um, a lytic uh, growth cycle, and that is essentially simply how they reproduce themselves, that's not the only uh, type or form of growth cycle that phages can enjoy. And there's a large class, perhaps even a majority of bacteriophages, that enjoy what is referred to as a temperate um, life uh, state. Um, what that means is that when a temperate phage infects its bacterial host, there are two possible alternative outcomes. One of those outcomes is lytic growth, um, in which they propagate themselves in exactly the same way as I described to you in the previous slide. And normally that occurs perhaps 80 or 90 percent of the times that the host cell is infected by a temperate phage. 10 to 20 percent of the time, there's an alternative outcome. And that alternative outcome is referred to as lysogeny. In lysogeny, the lytic genes, the genes that are required to propagate itself and, and lyse and kill the cell, they're all switched off, they are repressed. And the phage DNA establishes itself um, so that it can be propagated in the long term within the subsequent uh, growth cycles of the bacterial host. And that's usually, although not always, accomplished by integration of the phage DNA into the bacterial chromosome. So the phage genome itself becomes incorporated and becomes a part of the bacterial chromosome and gets, repl gets replicated just like all of the other bacterial genes do. So we can think of lysogeny as a form of parasitism, um, where the phage is simply going along for the ride in what is otherwise um, a very healthy cell. 
uh, it's basically it's a free ride uh, through many, many generations of bacterial growth. So lysogens uh, tend to be stable, um, but they are not uh, going to, they don't have to uh, be, uh, remain in that state forever. Uh, they can go through many, many, many rounds of, of, of growth. However, uh, as a process that happens either spontaneously or can be induced by D, uh, DNA damage, such as UV light, um, lysogens can leave this, uh, this, uh, uh, this, the, the comfort of that uh, life cycle and they can be induced into full lytic growth. There's a relatively easy way to distinguish between phages that are temperate and those that are lytic and, and can only undergo the lytic uh, growth cycle by the types of plaques that you see on agar plates. Lytic phages form simply just clear plaques, as shown in the bottom right-hand corner here, where all of the cells within that infected area have been killed, killed by phage infection. Over on the left at the bottom here, you can see what temperate uh, phages look like. They form turbid plaques. You see plaques because there's cells that are being killed through lytic growth and propagation of the virus. But there's that important and key subset of cells that, uh, that in which lysogeny is established, and those, uh, those lysogens are able to survive and to grow, and they can grow perfectly happy, even though they're bathed within this um, density of bacteriophage particles. So the fact that lysogens can actually grow quite happily, even though there's lots of viruses around to infect them, um, is referred to as superinfection immunity. Lysogens are immune to superinfection by a phage of the same or a closely related type. Um, this slide just shows an example of, of how that can be uh, studied and what that looks like in the lab. Um, at the top left here are uh, plaques of a turbid uh, uh, phage, a temperate phage growing on a lawn of bacteria using either a toothpick or a wire. Um, you can go and pick cells from the very center of one of those plaques, streak it out on an agar plate, as shown at the bottom left here, um, in order to generate single colonies, each grown up from a single cell that will have come from the turbid plaque. And then these individual colonies can in turn be tested for their immune phenotypes as shown in the top right. In this example, we're looking at, um, we're comparing a non-lysogenic strain with a lysogen. And in the top, we've just spotted on dilutions of a bacteriophage sample. And you can see that these serial dilutions um, from the most going down to the least uh, number of particles um, gives you the tighter, i.e. the number of particles per milliliter of, um, uh, of, of sample on the non-lysogen. But when you compare it with exactly the same dilutions of that particular phage onto a lysogen uh, of itself, so this particular phage is called Giles, on the right is the Giles lysogen, and you can see that there is essentially very little infection, except perhaps a little bit of clearing at the very highest concentration of phage at the top left-hand corner of that panel. And a control phage, in this case below it, showing L5, um, which is also a temperate phage, but it does not share immunity with Giles, and therefore you see essentially the same number of plaques uh, on the lysogen uh, of Giles and the non-lysogen. And therefore, bacteriophages can be grouped together according to their immune specificities, and it can be done just by comparing uh, the infectivity of a whole set of phages on lysogens and non-lysogens. So this is an important parameter uh, uh, that enables us to group together phages that may be similar by sharing these types of uh, parameters. I mentioned that phage DNA can, can integrate itself into the host chromosome, and this is a common feature of temperate bacteriophages. They do it by a process which is referred to uh, as site-specific recombination. This process is catalyzed by an enzyme which is called integrase 
um, or INT for short. The integrase is encoded by the phage genome. An integrase catalyzes recombination between two specific sites or segments of DNA. One is the so-called phage attachment site, or ATP for short, and the other is a specific site within the bacterial chromosome, which is, which is called the attachment site for the bacterium, or ATB. Integration results in the formation of what is called a prophage, an integrated phage DNA. It's become part of the chromosome, and it is now the prophage DNA is flanked by the left and right attachment sites referred to as uh, ATAL and ATAR, respectively. Uh, this reaction um, does use um, host functions quite commonly. Um, integrase works together with a host protein, a bacterial protein called integration host factor, or IHF for short. Um, and you'll recall that I told you that lysogens can undergo spont spontaneous or, or induced induction into lytic growth, which means that um, there has to be a process for this to come back out again, a biological reversal of this overall reaction. That's called excision, and excision is again catalyzed by integrase, and there is a second phage-encoded protein called excise, or XIS for short, um, and excise is a protein that essentially dictates and determines the directionality of how uh, these reactions will occur. In the absence of excise, you do integration. In the presence of excise, then the integrase um, is uh, only capable of doing the excision reaction. A few years ago, um, uh, people started thinking about how many bacteriophages there really were out there in the biosphere. And what they did was they developed a technique called epifluorescence, where they could take a sample, let's say of seawater, which is easy to get, um, get seawater, add a sample of a dye, which binds to the nucleic acids, place that sample under, the, under a fluorescence microscope, and simply uh, look and count for the viruses and other components that you see um, in that kind of experiment. This is an example of what they saw. There's a very large number of what you can see as small green fluorescent dots here. Those are all of the viruses that are present. And there's a smaller number, um, a fewer number of these large, brighter spots, um, which are larger objects, and they are the bacteria. And so what it was possible to do was to simply to count how many virus-like particles are present in these samples. And, and when that was done, uh, it was clear uh, that the viral population is indeed absolutely vast. When you measure, there's about 10 to the power of 6 to 10 to the power of 7 viral particles per mil. And this number seems to be reasonably steady no matter where you look. Um, it's true uh, in seawater if you look in coastal samples, if you look in oceanic samples, or the surface, or the deep. Um, and there's a similar abundance or a related degree of abundance in terrestrial samples as well, it is, it is believed. And so because we can measure the number of particles present in small samples and we can multiply the amount of uh, seawater and the amount of uh, terrestrial components, and when we do that we can conclude that the, the biosphere contains a total of 10 to the power of 31 um, virus particles, the vast majority of which are bacteriophages. This is an incredible number. This number would suggest that there's more bacteriophage particles in the biosphere than all other biological entities added together. Phages are in fact the majority of all biological things in the biosphere. They're not only abundant, uh, this appears to be a very dynamic population as well. Um, you can see from the fluorescence patterns in this slide, um, but it's true in, in most samples that have been examined, that the ratio of bacteriophage particles to bacteria is about between 5 to 1 and 10 to 1. 
And that's important because it means that, um, that the bacteria are likely to constantly be subjected to infection by the bacteriophages um, in their natural environments. And in fact, there are ecological studies that estimate the number of viral infections per second um, that occur on a global scale. And that number is estimated to be between 10 to the power of 23 and 24, um, which is just an incredible number of, uh, of activity, a dynamic population. Indeed, um, these numbers would suggest that the entire phage population turns over every four or five days. It is a large and a stunningly dynamic um, set of um, biological items. Not surprisingly, perhaps, um, the viral population is extremely diverse when we look at the genetic level. Um, currently, um, uh, a number far short of 10 to the power of 31 phage particles have been subjected to DNA sequencing, perhaps about 650 or so. Uh, and from these genomes, we can look and we can see how similar or different they are to each other. And, and what we learn from this is that indeed there's many, many different types of sequences and these genomes appear to uh, harvest and to contain large numbers of genes which are unlike any other genes that we've seen before. So we can conclude then that bacteriophages represent the majority of all biological entities uh, in, the, in the biosphere. They're a dynamic population constantly infecting bacterial hosts and, and generating more copies of themselves. The bacteria must be struggling to maintain their survival through resistance uh, to these infections. And um, I think a compelling argument can be made that this population has probably also been evolving for a very long time, perhaps two, three, perhaps even four um, billion years, extending right back to the very early days of when life uh, evolved. And, and, and finally, phages um, appear to uh, represent the largest unexplored reservoir of, of new genetic information uh, in the biosphere. If you want to discover new genes, perhaps with new functions, perhaps with new structures, um, the, bi the bacteriophage population, uh, I think we would argue, is exactly where you should start to look. In part two, we'll look in some more detail at the genetic structures of uh, bacteriophage genomes uh, and, and see how that's given us some insights into how these genomes have evolved.